Appropriations Act of last year. Uh, all of this designed to provide us uh, the resources to be able to fight fires effectively and efficiently. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Secretary Jewell, who shares with us in the Department of Interior this enormous responsibility of protecting life and property uh, of our firefighters and those who live uh, in the 70,000 communities and 45 million homes uh, that are interfacing our, uh, our forest, uh, forested lands. She's been a great partner, a uh, great advocate for adequate resources, and a great advocate for uh, fire-ready communities. Secretary Jewell. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. I can't think of a better partner in these efforts. Uh, you and your folks have just been terrific. And good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Denver, Colorado, where it has been wet and it's green outside, and you wouldn't think of it as a place with high fire risk, but I will tell you that uh, there's an awful lot of fuel out there that's growing very actively. And if it dries out, if we have some dry lightning, it'll be a very different picture in uh, just a few mo months. You know, managing wildland fires requires a high level of coordination among all effective agencies, uh, fire-prone communities, and private landowners, uh, and state players all working closely together. Because wildfires know no boundaries. So it's absolutely essential that we have this teamwork and cooperation, and I just appreciate all the work that Interior and USDA does on this front alongside uh, so many partners at the, the state, local, and private level. We've also had a chance to meet with some of the firefighters and the smoke jumpers who work on the front lines to suppress wildfires. These are courageous women who put in long hours of hard work in very difficult circumstances. They're away from their families and friends for long stretches of time, and of course there's risk in the work that they do, even though we're very committed to their safety. So on behalf of Secretary Vilsack and myself, I want to acknowledge all the firefighters, the employees, and the people across the country who make up our interagency teams responsible for ensuring our success each wildfire season. These people care about their jobs and their communities, and we are grateful for their service and their expertise. We know that we're facing another potentially severe and dangerous wildfire season, and Chief Tidwell will give you more information on that. It is no question it's exacerbated by climate change. Uh, it's led to prolonged western drought and longer, hotter, drier fire seasons. Extreme wildfires can risk drinking water for millions of Americans. They threaten our power grids. They destroy homes and businesses. And repairing damage to watersheds caused by wildfires can cost millions and take decades for vegetation to grow back. So there's a lot at stake for everyone. In Interior, we have more than 500 million acres of public land, including much of the rangelands in the West. So Interior and the various agencies of Interior are uh, a very important part of our wildland fire management program. We work very closely with the Forest Service and other federal, state, and local, and tribal partners to make sure the right plans are in place to protect communities, to save lives and property, and to restore fire-damaged landscapes across the country. This work doesn't just happen when wildfires occur. Throughout the year, our employees are working to mitigate the risks of wildfire. Our suppression resources are ready to respond rapidly and effectively. We are ready. We recognize that no one agency or department can be successful alone. Working as a team and backing each other up has become a way of life for all the fire agencies. It's part of the reason why these partnerships are a key part of my recent secretarial order on rangeland fire, which we implemented just last month. In fact, today uh, we're announcing another key important partnership in wildland firefighting that will help leverage key skills from former military members to assist in our wildland firefighting efforts like logistics, emergency medic medicine, risk mitigation, and management. So Interior's Bureau of Land Management earlier this spring entered into an agreement with Team Rubicon to provide wildland firefighting training and certification to 400 veterans to assist our current crews as they work to fight fire this season and going forward. It's also a great place uh, to seize on many of the talents that these individuals had and to help them heal uh, from some tough experiences overseas. The first training sessions are going to begin this month here in Denver and also in San Francisco and Philadelphia, then continuing next month in Seattle and Atlanta. So certainly, keeping the public and firefighters safe is our top priority. No structure or natural resource is worth the loss of human life. Our goal is the same high standard every year, no serious injuries, no fatalities. We're successful when everyone returns home safely and at the end of each shift. So I also want to emphasize that we all have a role to play here. We need help from homeowners and local communities to better protect themselves from wildfire threats before the fires begin and to help lessen the risk to communities and firefighters when they respond. It means 
if we live in that wildland urban interface, we've got to clear brush and trees and other flammable materials away from our homes. It means helping our neighbors and friends do the same. It's a great time for homeowners and communities to take proactive, proactive steps to minimize the risk of loss to wildfire, ranging from inexpensive weekend maintenance measures to create a defensible space around homes to comprehensive actions taken on a subdivision or community scale. Programs like Firewise Communities or Ready, Set, Go provide valuable information and assistance to individuals and communities to prepare for this fire season. Access to those programs can be found on the web or by calling your nearest local fire chief. So before I turn the call over to Forest Service Chief Tom Tidwell, I want to reiterate the budget reforms for wildland fire that Secretary Vilsack explained earlier in his remarks. The President's budget proposal, as well as pending bipartisan congressional legislation to reform the way wildfire suppression is funded, just makes good sense, especially when we're faced with higher and higher costs to fight fires during these long, hot, dry seasons we're experiencing. Here's an example. A firefighting suppression funds has exceeded budgeted levels at the Department of Interior in, neither ha in nearly half of the last 14 years. And for us, 1% of these fires equate to 30% of fire spending. These are emergencies. They should be treated as such and uh, do the same as we do with other emergency disaster needs. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to U.S. Forest Service Chief Tom Tidwell who's going to explain the wildland fire outlook for this season. Tom? Well, thank you, Secretary Jewell, Secretary Vilsack. Thank you for your support, your leadership, to ensure that we are being proactive to reduce the threat of wildfire to our communities and the threat to our firefighters and our pilots. And just to give a quick summary of the uh, fire potential outlook for the rest of the season, we've been very fortunate um, here through the central part of, of, of the states to have above normal precip. It's allowed us to postpone the fire season in this part of the country. We still have an active fire season in southern Arizona and, of course, in California and also in Alaska, where today there's a 25,000-acre fire burning. And as we look at the rest of the summer, you'll see the interior part of the country will dry out to a normal fire season, while California, Oregon, Washington, and northern Idaho moving into Montana, we'll see conditions deteriorate and we're predicting above average fire season. The best way to describe this is it looks like we're set up to have a very similar fire season as we had last year, where we saw seven of the 10 largest fires occur in California, Oregon, and Washington. So we're fortunate that we've been able to postpone the season in part of the country here to give our firefighters a little bit of a break so they can be ready for the rest of the the season. But once again, uh, it looks like we're going to have another very active fire season. And just to add to the point on the budget, last year we exceeded our uh, appropriated uh, fire suppression funds by $240 million. And once again, we're lined up to um, probably to have to deal with that again. So once again, Secretary, thank you for your support, your leadership on a very serious issue for America. Susan, with that, uh, we'll be uh, happy to take uh, the questions. All righty, reporters, just as a reminder to press star 1 on your phones to let us know that you want to ask a question. Our first question comes from Bill Theobald with USA Today. Yes, I, I wanted to get some reaction from any of the, of the three. The House Appropriations Committee released its draft of the um, Interior um, Appropriations Committee or Appropriations Bill, and it does not have the um, <clears throat> the uh, language that would allow for the uh, most severe fires to be treated as disasters. And I, I wondered uh, what your reaction to that was, and what you can do to try to to get that changed. Well, uh, speaking for the Forest Service, I, I think we are disappointed uh, that uh, that we didn't uh, we didn't have the uh, the uh, committee understand precisely what's it, what, what's at play here. Uh, the average uh, between uh, the range of costs for uh, for fires, we have a 90% chance of having to spend somewhere between 810 million and 1.62 billion. If it comes into the average, about 1.2 billion, we'll again have to borrow at least 200 million dollars from restoration and resiliency funds, which is the precisely the fund that reduces the risk long term of these catastrophic and horrific fires. Uh, Congress can't have it both ways. They can't come to us in December, 
January, February, and articulate the need for greater restoration and more work, uh, expanded recreational opportunities, and all of the things that occur with a healthy forest uh, when they won't give us the capacity and the resources to prevent the borrowing of funds. They cannot sustain, and we cannot sustain, this ever-increasing percentage of our budget going to fire suppression. Our only hope is that we continue to hammer this message uh, that those who are on the ground fighting these fires and understanding the risk uh, will reinforce the message to their members of Congress uh, and that the Senate will take a, a different view of this and understand what's at, what's at stake here. Uh, this is about fewer people. Uh, instability in our, in our funding uh, makes it extremely difficult, extremely difficult for us to do everything that folks want us to do and that we want to do. Uh, on our forested lands. Uh, these are national treasures. We understand the significance and importance of taking good care of them for future generations. We understand the important role they play in water conservation and preservation, particularly in a dry area of the country. Uh, we just can only hope that Congress finally wakes up to the fact that uh, we are just one or two horrific fires away from having to borrow money one more time uh, and in our case, it's 10 out of the last 15 years we've had to borrow from, uh, from those resources. The only thing I'll add uh, on behalf of Interior to what Secretary Vilsack said is that there is really good alignment, I'd say, on both sides of the political aisle about the importance of uh, this long-term fire fix for states where wildfire is a big issue. Uh, we are working very hard on the rangeland fire uh, issues in the Great Basin in particular in those states. And I think that with the companion bills in the House and Senate that had been introduced uh, with governors weighing in, um, which we will have, I'm sure, you know, we will continue to pursue uh, legislation that's independent of the budget to allow for the wildfire cap. Uh, and it's really going to be all hands on deck to continue to, to push this effort forward. The president's been supportive. We've had uh, Republicans and Democratic leadership supported. We've got a, a few roadblocks. Obviously, we haven't been able to get past, but we're, gonna, we're committed to continuing to push on those. What's frustrating about this, and I'd add this, what's frustrating about this is it's not asking about new dollars. It's just about spending the existing resources in a slightly different way. So it's not like you're increasing the budget. You're just simply using a fund that's set aside for natural disasters, and that's precisely what these are. Uh, one of the reasons why we have catastrophic fires is because of uh, pests and diseases that have destroyed millions of acres of timber in the western part of the United States. Most of these fires are started by lightning strikes. So it is every bit a natural disaster as a flood or a tornado or a hurricane. A and it is incumbent upon Congress to understand the significance of that uh, in making determinations about the budget. It's not new money. It's just spending money in a slightly different way that makes sense, that's, that's reasonable and rational. And reduces the cost long term. And, yeah, it reduces the cost long term. And we're not asking that they take all of the responsibility away from us. We'll fight the 98 to 99 percent of the fires in existing budgets uh, uh, during during the course of a year. We'll, we, we understand the importance of being held accountable, but it's the 1 to 2 percent of catastrophic fires that become hundreds of millions of dollars of fires that we can simply not afford. We then borrow from existing resources and we do less work, and that complicates and increases the risk of fire in the future. Let's continue with our reporters on the line. Once again, press star 1 if you want to ask a question. Dan Elliott with AP. Hi. Uh, my question is, um, how do you define a catastrophic fire? What What is a catastrophic fire? And a follow-up, what parts of the country are at, at risk of this kind of fire? I'm going to have the chief weigh in on the technical. There is a process by which we determine uh, uh, the, the, the funding, and so, Chief, do you want to weigh in on that in terms of the technical aspects of it? Yes, in the, the bipartisan, bicameral legislation that was introduced last Congress and, uh, and again introduced this Congress, which basically mirrors the President's request, it sets up criteria for those type of fires that, if they're you know, close to large communities, uh, where we normally need to spend a lot of money to be able to keep the fire out of communities, it's one of the criteria. Uh, there's, and it's very specific about which fires can be, um, you know, included in this. It also has a, um, a provision that if towards the end of the fire season that when we run out of money, then the secretaries can determine that any additional fires will come out of this additional fund. The thing that, that's so important about this is that 
we're still going to fund, you know, 98 to 99 percent of the fires out of our appropriated budget. And last year, just with the Forest Service, the 10 most costly fires, 10 fires equaled $323 million. Out of how many? Out of uh, over thousands, just for the Forest Service. Tens of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. He also asked about what parts of the country are at risk. Well, the parts are at, uh, right now is a, it definitely a southern Arizona and then, of course, California, just like it was last year. It's going to continue. And then as we move um, later into the season, Oregon and Washington and northern Idaho, very similar to what we, what we saw last year. And once again, Washington had their um, the largest fire in the history of the state, the Carlton Complex, you know, occurred last year. So their conditions are very similar to what they, they had last year. So we expect to see very large fires, probably at least in those three states, plus an additional potential up in northern Idaho moving into uh, western Montana. One additional point is that the fire season is, is longer. Uh, it's uh, somewhere between 60 and 80 days longer than it has been traditionally. And that is a reflection of the condition of the forests and grassland areas that, that extend the fire season. So not only are we fighting more fires, we're fighting them over a longer period of time during the year, uh, which again complicates the whole uh, the budget situation. Alrighty, reporters once again, press star one if you'd like to ask a question. Up next, Arizona Public Media's Zach Ziegler. Yes, I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit about, uh, you know, traditionally the southwest is kind of a hotbed for fire states like Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. Uh, what is it that's making the northwest a little more of the dangerous spot this year? Well, it's a factor of the weather patterns that um, have occurred over the Pacific this last year that was referred to as El Nino. That's actually brought up more moisture through the, the southwest much earlier than we normally see. But what also happens in an El Nino is that you also see much drier conditions up in the Pacific Northwest. So what we're seeing uh, today, this, this fire season, is it's actually just following the predictions from the Weather Service of what we would see you know, throughout this, this year. A prolonged drought in California is also creating risk. All right. Once again, reporters, if you'd like to ask a question, please let us know by pressing star one on your touch tone pad. Um, we don't have any other calls, so any closing remarks, Secretary Vilsack, Secretary Jewell, Chief Kidwell? Well, I just want to uh, again acknowledge uh, the men and women who fight these fires and the extraordinary uh, risk that they take every single year. And we owe it to them uh, to do everything we possibly can to make sure that they have the resources and that we reduce the risk to the, to the, to the extent possible. And, and we need an ally and a partner in Congress. Uh, sequester, uh, some of the budget uh, gimmicks that have been taking place really complicate uh, the ability to protect uh, these firefighters and to put them in a situation where they have the best chance of success in putting these fires out quickly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that this is the year that we finally uh, crack the code, so to speak, uh, and uh, get the fire budgeting straightened out so that in the future we reduce the risk of these horrific fires, uh, that we get back in the business of restoring these wonderful treasures that we have so that people and families can enjoy them uh, for years to come. The only thing I would add is that uh, we're ready uh, when fire strikes. We uh, will do a great job. Uh, we hope Mother Nature is good to us. She may or may not be, whether the lightning is dry or whether the lightning's wet. Um, we have an opportunity to put veterans to work this year. We are prioritizing our landscapes in a way we never have before, which is recognizing the value of rangelands in addition to forested lands. And uh, I want to thank. Chief Tidwell and Secretary Vilsack for their strong partnership in the rangeland uh, restoration efforts as well as uh, in fighting fires on the ground. We're, uh, we're ready to go and uh, we need everybody's help to uh, uh, support our, um, our, our programs so that we can do this in a really smart way over the long term, as Secretary Vilsack said. I just want to thank um, everyone that works together from the federal agencies, the state, the local, the county fire, the folks that suppress these fires. And we are making a difference with our focus on restoring the nation's forest and grasslands. 
every year there's, there's more and more examples where the work that we're doing is reducing the threat to our communities, the threat to our firefighters, to our pilots, and reducing the severity of these fire to watersheds that so many communities rely on for the municipal drinking water. But there's more work to be done, and if we can get the budget fixed, then we're going to be able to continue the Secretary's goal to increase the pace and scale of restoring the nation's forests and grasslands. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for joining us for our call, and that concludes the call for now.